Uh, today I'm going to talk about a, a project I've had for a bunch of years. Um, this is a longer story. It starts back in 2014 when I wrote the first version of that thing. And that thing is a little social network for people who saw, where they can share their projects, where they have a database that the community builds together. And um, this is kind of like the fifth or sixth iteration of that thing. Maybe the, the second serious iteration of it after I tried many different languages. And so in 2021, I was writing my social network again. And uh, this time, I was writing this in Rust and in SvelteKit. So for, for contrast, the first iteration of this project of mine was written in Django. So it was a monolithic web application where you just had traditional server rendered pages. But this time, I was going for the client server architecture that had become modern in the recent years and de facto industry standard. So you have some kind of backend in this case, a Rust backend, and a frontend in this case uh, implemented in SvelteKit, and both of them, so they communicate via an HTTP API. So SvelteKit frontend makes requests to the backend, and the backend responds with uh, via HTTP as well. Okay, so uh, I mean I'm, I'm not the best organized person here, so. Um, <laughs> I started this off uh, this time, actually going out for user feedback a lot of times. So I did these user interviews and asked people what to do uh, and change, and like what is working, what is not working. So I had a lot of changes on this application. And you can imagine a client-server application where you make a lot of changes, means a lot of changes to the API, a lot of opportunity for mistakes where the API uh, that the front end and the back end get out of sync on what the API is. And uh, yeah, in, at some point I got really mad at this. Like, these are avoidable mistakes. Like, there is one API, so why am I implementing this one API twice on the server and on the client? So effectively, I was building that API in two places. I was making lots of avoidable mistakes because of that, and the one question you always ask yourself, like when you have a thing that you build in two places, well, is there a single source of truth that I can have instead? Can I build this in a single place and then um, make the other places fall into place? So to make the front end and the back end agree to a single source of truth that says, what is the API? And this is particularly frustrating when you have a statically typed languages on the front end and on the back end. So you know that types give you a lot of safety already on the back end, types give you a lot of safety on the front end, but you have this API gap between which uh, you lose the entire type safety since you have to uh, enforce just by, by hand, by testing that the endpoints and the HTTP calls coming from the front end match up. So when I get mad, I get to work. So uh, in 2021, I <laughs> made an, uh, a spec uh, for my API in TypeScript, and I generated code from it for the back end and for the front end. So that I could enforce that the routes provided by the back end would match up with the HTTP calls the front end is making to the back end. Um, eventually, I abandoned this project again. <laughs> And in 2022, I learned uh, OCaml, and this talk uh, today is about uh, the API spec and the generated code that I ported to OCaml partially. So I did not really finish this, but I learned a lot from this, and I have uh, some interesting code to show here. So let's see. First thing you will ask yourself, like, what could this look like in the end? So what does an API spec even look like? So an API spec needs to kind of talk about the endpoints, like what endpoints are there provided by the API that can be called by the client. And um, so essentially we list all these routes there, all these paths under which ATTP requests are accepted and handled by the back end. 
and then we need to say something about what is the data going in and going out. So to create such a spec, the most obvious thing is probably to create a domain-specific language. And what is a domain-specific language? Um, examples of domain-specific languages are CSS, SQL, regular expressions, Open API specification language, GraphQL. So there is a ton of domain specific languages. These are languages that are not general purpose programming languages, but they are languages that describe only a very specific domain. And a language always comes with a syntax, which is like what you write, and some semantics, what the thing means that you wrote. With DSLs, there's also a bigger distinction between them. Um, they're subdivided into external DSLs and internal DSLs. So external DSLs, they work quite similar to, to a compiler front end, actually. So you get some very um, customized syntax. But to achieve that, you have to relax that, parse that, and then generate an abstract syntax tree from that. And an abstract syntax tree is nothing other than a representation of the program or the artifact that you're writing in the language uh, using types and values in the host language where you implement the DSL. So in contrast, an internal DSL is much simpler. Instead of going through all the, the work and effort of having a dedicated syntax that is legs parsed and then transformed in an abstract syntax tree, we just build the abstract syntax tree directly by using functions in the host language or just writing the values out there into the program. Obviously, this is a much simpler solution, and as someone who does not have a huge team to do this, you always uh, choose the internal DSL simply because uh, it is so much easier. You get so much for free. So one of the big struggles with external DSLs is editor support. Um, you have to write editor plugins if you want your languages to, to language to be supported properly by an editor. With an internal DSL, in contrast, you just piggyback on the editor support of your host language, and life is just much simpler. So when you build a domain-specific language, like the most important thing is obviously looking at the domain, because if you don't understand what you're talking about, uh, you, you will not build a useful thing. So. Uh, Domain here is, uh, there is a, an HTTP server. It has routes that respond to HTTP requests. And these HTTP requests, they have some data that goes in and via the request and data that comes out via the response. So it's not, so anyone who's been doing web, web development probably knows all of this stuff by heart and is very bored by it. Um, but yeah, so, there's two things we need to talk about when we make a DSL for an HTTP API. And one of these things is the endpoint, and the other thing is the shape of the data. Like, what can I put into the API to get something out of it, and what will I get out of it? So let's look at the shape of data. This is basically quite simple. So in this case, the API was a JSON API, so this kind of mirrors a little bit uh, what you can do in JSON, since if you want to bridge a gap between a front end and a back end, you always communicate via some, some kind of protocol in this case, or some kind of representation of values, and this rep value representation here is JSON. So I started off with numbers, strings, um, flows, Records, there can be optional fields, so this is nulls and JSON. But since my host language and so since both my, my backend language and my front end language have reasonable support for some types, union types, so in case of Rust and TypeScript, Rust has very, very good support for some types, union types. Um, 
TypeScript has okay support for them, but you have to watch out how you model them since you have a bunch of options. Um, but so I figured that's the data I want to transmit. And a some type, uh, if anyone's unfamiliar with that, is something like this. So you have a type that has multiple different possibilities what it can be. So here the user can be a member of some other record type carried by this constructor. Or a business which could have other fields in that record. So let's look at some code. Um, so to model the abstract syntax tree of, of this data, we somehow just need to transform our understanding of what the data is that we ship back and forth into types of the host language. In this case, this is some OCaml. And modeling first the primitive types, strings, integers, uh, booleans, floats. Then the next one is more interesting. Uh, so to describe these types, you could have uh, you could refer to another type by name. So at some point, we, we need to define types by names, right? Because if we don't do that, we will not be able to define data that is recursive within itself, so like comment trees. Think of comment trees. Comments can have replies, and the replies will have the same type as the comment which again can have replies and so on. So you, you need a way to um, represent recursive type and that's why we need this type name here in order to reference to other types defined before. Okay, other than that, yeah, so there's primitive types uh, embedded into this type T. Uh, the option, which can be carry any value of type T and the array, which can also carry a, any element type T. Uh, then come the records. We have uh, records are just names and, and field definitions. So fields again are names and their types. And then we can make type declarations this way. So we get records, enums, uh, and the sometimes I call record union here because they are quite nicely modeled as unions of records. So this is a very restricted and very, very limited language, intentionally, for simplicity's sake. So when you don't make an API spec for general purpose use with lots of configurable knobs and lots of features, you can restrict yourself to just the shapes of data that you actually want to transmit. And I feel that this is a huge, uh, huge benefit of making your own API spec DSL over choosing something existing, simply because you have the control over uh, what is admissible and what is not admissible. And when you look at this, pretty, pretty clear, what we're doing here is we are describing types, right? So we are implementing types inside uh, OCaml to model all the permissible shapes of the data. Good, so we have an abstract syntax tree, so we can write, write some types. We can write some shapes of data. So here, for example, we have a record, uh, a user record that has uh, two fields, a display name, which is a string, uh, as well as a user ID field, which refers to the user ID type. And yeah. So, so that way we can already write an abstract syntax tree in the host language. It just works out of the box. But it's a little clunky, right? A bit of verbose, kind of kind of painful to look at even. So that record union event here has these two cases, join and leave. They happen to carry the same fields, but they don't have to. They could be entirely different, uh, carry entirely different payloads here. Um, yeah, okay, but this is verbose, and this looks super annoying, right? So if you see this, you, you like immediately want to start refactor this. And um, this is actually exactly the thing you do in order to build an internal DSL. You refactor the abstract syntax tree. That's, that's really all there is to it. Um, 
you, you look at this thing and think like, okay, what is a more beautiful, more compact way to write this? And then you create these helper functions that allow you to write the abstract syntax tree in a nicer way, in a way that doesn't give you a headache and that doesn't make your, your friends mad when they, they look at your code and everything like that. So, yeah, and, and it starts off with very simple things like uh, introducing shorthands for this primitive type string or the primitive type integer. Um, for the option and the array, there isn't much of a difference, isn't there? Not at all, right? So this is not shorter. The only difference is that when you define uh, a function here that constructs this option, it looks more uniform with the rest of, of the DSL of the language. So that's why I would do it. Um, yeah, so same thing for the record. I mean, it's, it's not doing much, right? It's, it's almost doing nothing here. Um, but what we get out of this by refactoring the way we write the abstract syntax tree is that things suddenly look like this. And this, this is not as painful as it used to be, right? So this is more like uh, the usual code you see in, in web frameworks uh, or anywhere else. The complexity here kind of checks out with what this is doing for us. Yeah, and this is just the same example we had before. So just going back and forth. So we had this painful thing here to look at. Oh, sorry, no, no. And now, now life is better. And we have a domain specific click language for describing the shape of data that <coughs> the API accepts and responds with. And there's nothing magic about it. So that's, that's the amazing part. That there's nothing magic about it. It's like anyone can do this. Okay, but this is only the shape of data. So the other kind of thing we need to model is the endpoints. And endpoints are such that there is a path under which the server will react to HTTP requests. There is the HTTP method associated with that endpoint. So whether it's get, post, uh, delete, push, pad, uh, put patch, and so on. Then there may be parameters in the URL. So you could have a route user ID to get some data about a particular user. There can be query parameters. So often on search pages, I think we've all seen this, uh, using the web. And um, the last thing is, we have these request bodies where we can send data to the API and get data back from the API. And for those, we can very naturally use the uh, data DSL that we just made. So what does this roughly look like in terms of AST? So I'm, I'm not showing all the code here, but just talking a bit and explaining <coughs> What, what is this like? So, uh, for example, here's a type of the post endpoint, and this is um, the most complex one because it has the most possibilities what you can send and get back. So, post endpoints, you can use URL parameters, you can use query parameters, you can have an input body uh, and an output body, which are represented uh, as JSON body, which is just a value of the data uh, DSL, of the data AST. So for URL parameters, these essentially look like associative lists, so lists of pairs of names and types, and the query parameter is the same, lists of pairs of names and types. Everything is pretty straightforward here. Um, and to represent the method of the endpoint, I chose to represent this as a uh, sum type where uh, the constructor is the method. You could do this entirely different, but doing it this way enforces that I cannot get uh, the, the parameters wrong here. So in case of the get endpoint, for example, I cannot send an input body. And I want my host language, this type checker, to actually check this for me. So I can't do this wrong. Um, right. And then 
the endpoint type is just a name for the endpoint so that we know what kind of code to generate, like what's the name of the handler and what's going to be the name of the function generated for the client used to call the HTTP endpoint. Um, the path, the sort of URL under which this is reachable, so every endpoint has this. And then this, this shape here, the post, get, delete, push, pad, and so on. Okay, so again, refactoring this, um, we, we are not looking at this in detail, but here, this is quite nice to see in the post function that constructs a value or uh, an endpoint value here. Uh, we can make use of optional parameters in OCaml. I like this part really well because very often you don't have URL parameters and you don't have query parameters and you don't always want to write like, oh, they are empty or they are, they are none. This is boring to write. So having these the default empty is like an obvious thing to do, which gives you uh, a language like this. So you specify the uh, method of the endpoint, um, then give it a name, a path, and then have the input type represented via the data DSL. Actually, not quite via the data DSL because, oh, oh no, yeah, yeah, quite, quite so much like the data DSL, yeah. But there's always a bit of massaging going on. Like you can always like look at this in terms of refactoring. Like what can I move into this post function? What is the minimal thing the user needs to give me here so that I can construct the AST from that? And uh, this is kind of a process, like kind of a, not back and forth, but a process of seeing, oh, this is repetitive. I don't need to give this because it's always the same thing. And then you move it into the function. Um, giving a better DSL that is shorter and uh, less annoying to write. Good, okay, so yeah, we can write ASCs, yeah, <laughs> good. But what, what, what do we do with that? So it's not very really useful on its own, right? So we have now a way to write down what, is, what are the endpoints, what is the shape of data transmitted or through the HTTP API, but on its own that is not useful. So this only becomes useful if we use this some way to bridge the gap between the front end and the back end. And yeah, um, a way to bridge this gap is through code generation. So we can take the data ASC to generate types in both languages, which will enable us to force the back end to implement the correct shape of data for the handlers. And same thing for the front end, which we also force to send the correct shape of data and receive the correct shape of data back. Yeah, from the endpoints, we then generate routes for the back end and bindings for the front end. Where bindings for the front end are just wrapper functions around HTTP requests to the endpoint. So for this data, abstract syntax free code generation. We generate types, but not only types. So we also need a way to turn these types to the data format that goes over the wire. In this case, JSON. So we would generate types, JSON serializers and deserializers, as well as query deserializers as needed by the backend endpoint. So not every backend endpoint needs all of those. Um, and not every type needs all of those but many of the types generated will need a JSON serializer or deserializer on the back end. On front end, not so much because TypeScript already has JSON serializer and deserializer built into the language. Uh, as long as the shape of the objects in TypeScript is actually the same as what's in the JSON. Okay, so for the endpoints, ASC, we generate code for the back end and the front end. So looking at the back end, we have this endpoints abstract syntax tree, which also contains data AST values like the query parameters, the JSON bodies, and such. And so we generate types and uh, serializers, deserializers for, for these data AST values, and we generate routes for the web framework. And now this is again a thing. Um, 
when you are writing this, just for yourself, for one thing, um, you have a choice to just not do it for everything. So you do it for the web framework you use, and life is pretty okay. Because you tend to know what way you need to write the routes, it's very easy to generate, and you, I don't know, you just do it. You don't read uh, endless pages of documentation and configuration logs, you just do it. So this looks roughly like this. So we have some data that goes over the wire, like the user type. For the input types, we have these JSON bodies. They uh, are generated in this case always with a suffix of input and output. Um, you can go into a lot of detail here and serialize only the, the outputs, uh, deserialize only the inputs, but let's not go down this rabbit hole now because I think I have to not talk too much. <laughs> okay, um, so routes for the back end. We generate these types and we generate routes. And for the routes, we just render it routes in a format that your web framework needs. In this case, uh, this is just code uh, to show and read and not code to run. Um, so you create a function create user by code generation, it reads the body, then it deserializes this input body that for using the type that was generated and its serializer. And we have a type annotation uh, which guarantees that we will match the expected output format uh, specified file in the DSL. So, and, and that's pretty much all there is to it. So most web frameworks you also have to register the route somewhere with a router. Nothing special happening here. For the front end, we do a similar thing. We again generate the types. Uh, but from the endpoints, we generate client bindings wrapping the HTTP calls. This can look like this. So you now have a function create user uh, that takes a body of the input body type of that route and it returns a promise with the output, with the response type of that route. And you know, this is just implemented as a thin, very, very thin wrapper around some, some library that allows you to make HTTP calls. You may need some, do some kind of massaging on the responses in order to get, uh, to get these wrapper functions obey these types in the way that you want. Like, depending on error handling, you can also model errors and all the things that you, you need. Right, and JSON serializer is not necessary here. Okay, what does this give us? So when we do this, we get like something you could call API-driven development. So instead of me just making a change on the back end, uh, then uh, getting distracted, doing 20 other things, and forgetting to update the front end, later getting mad at myself for again uh, not having written a test for this thing, um, Instead of that, I modify the API specification, generate code, and then I get compiler hints for anything I forget to update. So, errors. I get nice errors. Uh, so, for that, uh, I have prepared just a tiny, tiny, tiny example thing here. And so, this is the create user endpoint that takes two fields, display name and user ID. And now we want to add another field to this, um, which, let me see. Then we can go over here, we can run the code generation. We can try to build the backend now. And what we get is a, an error, which is like what we want. Really to make this type safe, what we want is we want to get errors every time we, uh, we do the wrong thing and we don't obey the API spec. So now we could go into handlers ML, fix that error and the program will compile again on the front end. Same thing. We get an error uh, complaining that this field is missing. We can go into this function, we can add the missing field recruited by 
and then it compiles. In the handler, same thing, we go here, complains that there is no field recruited <coughs> by. And then I have to uncomment this because OCaml is a little bit funny when it comes to not using values, you will always make this an error. Yeah, and then it compiles again, life is okay, right? So this is what I wanted. Uh, now I was happily writing code after this kind of detour. Uh, but it turns out that this detour was very much worse. It's simply because of the sheer amount of mistakes I would make and the hate I had for writing unnecessary tests when I could do this with types in a single source of truth instead. So I'm pretty happy with this workflow. Yeah, but okay, so just to wrap this up, um, how does the code generation actually work? And there's nothing special here again, so this is really, really primitive. The word is made of functions, and uh, so we here have functions from the abstract syntax tree to render strings that contain the code that we want to have for the front end and for the back end. So it just generates code by string concatenation, like the simplest uh, thing you can do here, most likely. Yeah, so I'm not using any target language abstract syntax trees to, to then have more type checking and much higher complexity in building this DSL and code generation, but instead I just do string concatenation as necessary when, um, yeah, and debug from there until things work. Really. Yeah, so there's two GitHub repositories for this. The first version of the DSL and code generation in uh, TypeScript. Uh, this is not actually the project here, so the actual project I have was, uh, is still private, but this is a different project that would have been a part of, of the social network. And you can have a look at the TypeScript code generation. It's not as well structured as the OCaml version, but the OCaml version is very unfinished, and there are a bunch of things that are really construction sites where I get mad at OCaml ecosystem where we need a, a better way to, to render JSON into a format that TypeScript likes, that TypeScript can handle well. Uh, so one of these things that, that makes me mad is like the way some types are often modeled in OCaml JSON serializers and deserializers. So they model this by uh, arrays of lengths two where the first element is the tag of the uh, the variant and the second element is the payload carried by the variant and this is awful. In Rust I got with 30 uh, an option in, in the serializer deserializer to make the tag of the variant just inlined into the record carried by the variant and this was quite beautiful to use in TypeScript since you can do a case switch on that uh, type field and then get pattern matching in TypeScript that actually works. Yeah, right. Anyways, but this is just one, one thing and everything is fixable. So I hope at some point uh, my rewrite will finish and I will happily use that ever after. What we did today here was look at an internal DSL for uh, expressing the shape of data or an endpoints between uh, front end and back end of an HTTP API. We uh, established type safety between the front end and back end by generating appropriate uh, type, uh, type annotations for the bindings and for wrapper functions around the actual implementations of the backend handlers. Yeah, so that's it. So, time for questions. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I understand the benefit of, of developing your own DSL for this kind of limited subset that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, have you considered, though, going in the other direction? So have you considered generating open API from your DSL? Uh, no, I haven't, because sheer of the complexity. So the sheer complexity, or I did look at open API, and uh, I did look at GraphQL, uh, and I got so mad at this that I did not want to look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but, but, but this is definitely a, a way you could do it. So you could definitely introduce uh, uh, OpenAPI as a target language, as one of the target languages 
But I think in many cases, like when you are a very small team, you don't want to take on this burden of open API. You instead want to provide people with SDKs, with client bindings, to access your API from various <laughs> languages directly. And this works really well with your own uh, API spec DSL, simply because you can express exactly what happens. You can express exactly how our ID types going over this barrier. How do they look like on the front end? How do they look like on the back end? And you can automatically uh, translate between them. So many things like that Open API will never do for you. Like. Unfortunately, I'm already in this open API. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry <laughs> to hear that. I know someone else, and, uh, and, and they also told me, like, Sabine, your code gen, gen is so much nicer to work with than the tooling around Open API. And yeah, but well, it's what it is. Uh, so uh, the code generation part, we essentially replace what we normally do in uh, business that like uh, business application, like creating the DTOs, like the data transfer objects. So you only need to duplicate it in the backend and then make sure that oh, yeah. it matches. So the code generation part eliminates kind of the that part. Yeah, exactly. So you you're writing the same thing in different places, and you eliminate that just having one DSL that code generates for the different places. Yeah, this is a good thing. Another question. Uh, have you thought about API versioning? API versioning, yes, absolutely. I mean, the good thing is when you have an API spec, you can easily API version because you can have multiple specs, like for every version, and then you, well, you know? Uh, what I'm thinking is supporting uh, clients that are still using the old version and now you're publishing a new version. Uh, well, API versioning is like kind of an orthogonal problem to the spec itself, but it is one way you could use the spec. So you could have an older APIs that you keep around, have a spec for each of them, and then provide client bindings for the different versions. Which, yeah, so you would only have to upgrade within the major version of, of the API. Um, so one thing that a lot of people do is they write, they write adapters uh, oh, yeah. so that uh, they can still support the older version of the API using the new of the yeah, yeah, right. So, so the implementation, yeah. So I'm thinking about generating the adapters as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, why not? Why not? If you if you can describe this and you can understand what is the shape of the thing you want to model, then yes, you can you can make a DSL for that. And it's always just about understanding what's the thing you're talking about like. What is it? Yeah. You could uh, like describe the changes. With yeah. some DSL primitives, yeah. and right. then that's yeah, yeah. like like mig migrations also. Yeah. You could uh, you there can describe a ton of things. Question all the way in the back. Thank you. So when you're writing code, it's quite convenient to have edit highlighting and stack traces. What extent is that compatible with code generation? Which is creating new code. Um. So uh, yes. You have uh, editor highlighting and autocomplete on writing the specification language, but you also have that on the generated code. So if you make this a different build step, if you don't use any, any kind of fancy built-in tooling that hides the artifacts from you, you can just generate files, you can put strings in those files where you rendered the functions, and you can debug this very nicely. So I found this much nicer to debug than many built-in macro systems or programming languages I've used simply because I always had an easy way to look at the file, look at, see the editor highlighting, see the error messages in the error, uh, in, the, in the editor, and uh, adjust my code generation from there until it did what it should be doing. There was also like a question I had, because you have to find a way to put the files in the specific places, the correct places right. in your separate project. Right. Yes. And I think that's what you hit behind the make command probably. You, yes. You, you start um, your code generator, and then you pipe okay. the output uh, to some specific place. So basically, I have a folder code gen here that holds the API spec. The API spec is the endpoints and the types. Uh, and then I have a main function here to run the code generation, which, uh, which orchestrates uh, the things that need mm -hmm. to happen. So this would... Um, also introduced some headers saying like this is automatically generated, don't edit this to remind my idiot self from the future not to not to write this and instead look at the right file and change it there. Um, <coughs> you know, <coughs> like the practical things. Or here like importing these this utils module in TypeScript where the HTTP uh, request functions live and 
and then at some point I would have to specify right all the output paths where does this actually go which could probably be done nicer but I just did the simplest thing I could come up with here so I personally think this is nice because this is code and it, it would be yeah, way worse if you have to specify like a couple of command line parameters for uh, hard coding all those uh, paths for example yeah right? yeah so. could could yeah it, it would be right it would introduce unnecessary complexity yes. here because this is the code gen for this particular API uh, it is the API spec for that particular API so we can as well have a main function that that produces this uh, and, and not do unnecessary motions here hey, um, I was wondering why or whether you thought about or uh, generating from the back end, so the oh, back -end from the back end, so yeah, yeah. So, so after after switching back end and front end languages for like five times before that, I figured that if I'm going to do this code generation thing and API specs thing, I want this to be entirely separate from front end and back end, so that if I get mad again <laughs> and start over, that I can use at least this code generation again. Yeah, that is a small for question because now, as far as I can see, the A specs now. Uh, um, or could be a subset of what the backend supports. So say there's a, another backend function that's actually not in the API spec, but it is technically there. Te uh, technically there, there's probably no checker that says. Right, right, exactly. So there is no no checker in the sense that you could you could have, could be offering more back more endpoints in the backend. But I, tr I I decided to trust myself this far not to do this <laughs> at this time. And, and I would even mm, probably go so far to trust other people I will hire to work on this to, to not do this if I put a big comment saying whoever does this has a problem with me. <laughs> I have a question? Yeah, hello. Um, in, in your code we can see you are also like generating documentation. Is that like work in progress? Or oh yeah, this is also a kind, of, kind of work in progress. Yes, so if you, if you generate uh, bindings and, and uh, endpoints, you can also generate documentation very, uh, very neatly. And well, what does the documentation look like? Uh, I don't know. Did I have this here somewhere? Oh, API documentation. Um, is it this one? Yeah, so it's very, very rudimentary. It's just like markdown and listing up the things, uh, uh, the types and the endpoints. It's nothing fancy. And yes, this is the thing that I actually got really mad about when, when, when writing this chat application. So before writing this chat application, I tried to use chat APIs on, on, on the web, like chat as a service. And, and what I've seen there is, is madness, like so many broken <coughs> SDKs offered by these companies. Documentation that is not matching what the API is actually doing. And it would be so easy to just do this instead. <laughs> Like, and I mean, I'm just a single person, and I wrote this over over a few uh, weeks, like maybe spending two weeks in total, like as an actual, actually active time, but refining this a little bit by bit as I went, and I don't see where's the bottleneck here. I mean, this is this is an obvious thing to do. <laughs> Another one? Yes. You mentioned GraphQL earlier. Yes. Yes, GraphQL is, uh, so GraphQL solves a very similar problem here, right? So you have a specification of what is the shape of data that goes into the API and what comes out. It's pretty much the same thing, just implemented in a very different way, in a way that loses you uh, HTTP caching, in a way that introduces a lot more complexity to gain back what you had with the REST API. And as a single developer, I cannot see myself choosing GraphQL simply because of this additional complexity that you have to carry around everywhere. But other than this, GraphQL does much of the same things. From the GraphQL chic schema, you can generate bindings, uh, you can generate these endpoints. It's, it's very similar, just more complex and more flexible. Yeah. So thank you. Let's. I'm sorry you're out of time, you have to take that offline. No so let's thank Sabine again.